have ain't a shouting message. I'm not taking away from that. But this is side B. Open your Bible to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. The apostle in Hebrews 12, beginning at verse 16, draws us back to that Old Testament time when two brothers were struggling over who's going to get the birthright, Jacob and Esau. Jacob has made some thin pea soup and Esau comes in hungry. He says, give me some soup. He said, I'll not give it to you unless you give me the birthright. He said, I'm so hungry that a birthright don't mean anything. And he hands him the ring signifying the birthright. He sold it. The Bible says for a mess of pottage. Just some thin pea soup. Now God says, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau. Please note that God put Esau in the company of fornicators and profane individuals who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward when he would have inherited the blessing he was rejected for he found no place of repentance. He found no place of repentance. Are you listening? He found no place of repentance though he sought it carefully with tears. There's coming a day when sorry and weeping and all the other things that we think God will hearken to that he'll not listen. On the platform this morning you see some road signs, danger signs. Signs that if you heed them you will be safer. Signs that if you choose to not heed them, you would not only put yourself but others in danger. Some of us here today have been so accustomed to seeing certain stop signs that we run right past them. And in doing so, you may get by with it for a while. But there's always a day to pay. Some of us are guilty of doing California stops. We just slow down and run right on past, disregarding the law. Life without Jesus is a dead end. You're headed to hell, and without Jesus in your life, the best of life is a dead end. The call is yield your life to Christ. Now there is a joyful side of the message. And the joy of the message that I shall deliver to you is the good news that Jesus saves sinners. Of whom no doubt I, like Paul said, am the chief. He saves all who come to him by faith and his finished work. And all who call on his name, Romans 10 says, shall be saved. That's the good news. I mean, that's shouting news. That's what we can rejoice over forever and forever. But the burden of this message and of my heart is that all about us 
There are multitudes that are on the road to hell. Have you noticed it? Down every street, down every avenue, down every lane and path, there are multitudes who are headed to hell. They have rejected Christ's love and His call as if eternity depended not on God's grace but upon their own works. Or they think that God is going to make an exception with them and He'll just forget about their sin and He will let them into heaven because He is such a loving God. The burden of my heart is that I know I am held personally accountable for so vast a multitude as who sit in this congregation Sunday after Sunday and who watch by means of television by the tens of thousands. And I will be held accountable when I stand before God for every sermon and for every plea for every preaching of the word. As a consequence, the daily obituary column in the paper has become like a nightmare as I read the names of men and women who are falling into hell without God and without hope. The news stories of wasted lives become like spears poking into my heart knowing that all around me I am surrounded by men and women who for whatever reason continue to waste their life. And I hear the call coming from every corner. Lost. 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 Men and women. Boys and girls. Lost from God. In order to relieve their conscience, many today argue there is no hell. May I say to you, the problem with that is that our dear Savior, who spoke us the truth in this word, preached more about hell than he did about heaven. The answer to the argument is found in the word of God when Jesus paints these graphic word pictures of the reality, the anguish, the suffering, and the eternality of hell. And no one can take solace in saying, oh, there's no hell, because God says there is. The other side of that question or argument is really half correct. For they say God is too loving to send somebody to hell. And may I say, God is a God of love. God is a God of grace. God is a God of mercy. But God is a God of justice and judgment. And when God says that He loves us, He offers us salvation, and He saves all who will call upon His name. But those who refuse His path of life, they commit their own soul. God doesn't send them. They commit their own souls into a devil's hell. I call your attention to the book of Mark, to chapter 9 where in verse 43 and following. And notice if you have a red letter edition of the Bible, this is all in red letters, meaning that this is the words of Jesus. Jesus said, If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. Man, that's drastic. That's unthinkable. If thy hand offend thee, Cut it off, for it is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell 
into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cause thee to fail from God, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. There are two words used in the Bible, translated in our Bible as hell. The first one is here in this passage. Gehenna. Jesus is actually coining a word when he says, in hell the fire is not quenched. It's a similitude. It's saying that hell is like the city dump where all of the refuse, where all the dead carcasses of animals and even some humans are cast. Out there where the worms, the maggots come out and are destroying those things there and the fire that has been lit just constantly burns day and night, day and night, never going out. Jesus said, that's like hell. Like hell, Gehenna, the lake of fire. The other word found in Luke 16 is Hades, where the Lord tells us that the rich man died and in hell, in Hades. Hades is the place that a person goes immediately when they die, if they die without faith, without God, without Christ, they go immediately into hell, into Hades. Gehenna is that lake of fire. Revelation chapter 20 tells us that there's coming a day when all of those who are being held in hell will be judged according to their works and all those will be cast along with the beast, the false prophet, and the antichrist into the lake of fire, into Gehenna. When God talks about eternity and punishment, God is plain. God is to the point. And those who die without Christ, who do we know? that went to hell. Well, the rich man did in Luke 16. Pilate evidently did. Judas did. Esau did. The unrepentant thief at the left hand of Christ on the cross rejected God's grace and died and went to hell's agony. If we could call them here one by one today, what would they say? I can hear them now. Esau, come and tell your story. Esau would stand and he would tell us, I wanted to repent. I wept because of what I'd done. I sought a time when God would have grace, but I'd gone too far. I'd gone too far. And there's no escape from hell. Too late. Too late to repent. The thief on the cross, he would say, so close, just a few feet away, just a prayer away, but I cursed him, I reviled him, I rebuked him, I rejected him, and now there's no hope. I'm in hell. Pilate, if he could speak as one person has described it, you would see him in the halls of hell going through the motions of washing his hand. There's no water there for him to wash his hands, but he cries, will they never come clean? Will they never come clean? The answer is no, Pilate. 
They will not. For what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Judas, what do you have to report? I can hear the clinking of 30 pieces of silver that I believe Judas will hear for all of eternity. And he would say, 30 pieces of silver. What a price for a man's soul. 30 pieces of silver. I had it in my hand, but it cost me my soul. See him, he throws it down and says, I don't want it. And goes out and hangs himself. But in hell, he says, for 30 pieces of silver, I gave up my soul. Rich man, what would you say? And he's the only one, by the way. We don't have to wonder what he said. The Bible tells us in Luke 16. For the rich man says, as he speaks to Abraham, I am tormented in these flames. Sing Lazarus, warn my brothers that they will not come to this place. Oh, the fire burns my soul. One drop, one drop of water. In hell today, those who inhabit that awful place are in such indescribable suffering that it is impossible for the human mind, I am sure, to even begin to think of what it's all like. And hell makes no exceptions, rich or poor, young or old, educated or illiterate. Every nation, every age, he makes no distinction for those who go to hell. Satan is in the wrecking business. God is in the saving business. What does the Bible say about the devil? He describes him in Peter's letter to the church as a roaring lion. If the newsman reported that on your street there was a lion that had escaped and it was roaming the streets and it was hungry and it already killed. Would you gather up your family, your wife, your children and say, let's go out here and see if we can see the lion? No, preacher, I'm not that stupid. I wouldn't do that. I'd lock the door and I'd say to my children, sit still, be quiet. We don't want to endanger ourselves. There's a lion roaming the streets. And yet, we bring a roaring lion right into our homes. And we introduce our children to him. And many times we see them devoured by him. The devil's in the wrecking business. The Bible says of him that he is a murderer. If you were told there's a murderer, a lunatic walking your street, he has killed before, he'll kill again. Would you gather up your family and go out and say, come in, we want you to visit with us. You'd say, preacher, I'm not that stupid. Why, I love my family. I wouldn't bring a murderer into my home. He might kill one of us or all of us. Yet, we open the doors to the enemy of the soul and we welcome him into our homes. The Bible says that he is a serpent, a snake. Would you go out gather up a sack full of rattlesnakes and bring them in and dump them out in the living room floor for your children to play with? No, preacher, I'm not stupid. Why, why not? They're a beautiful animal, but there's poison in those things. Why, they might sink their fangs into my family and they'd be killed. And yet, 
in more ways than I need to describe to you. We are placing our lives, our souls, and the souls of our children at the hand of the enemy, the hissing serpent of hell who is out to destroy each one of them. Satan's sole business is to get people to hell. Are you listening? Satan's sole business is to drag you down to hell. Now how's he doing that? First of all, by giving them excuses. Excuses. In the Bible we're told the parable when the master said that he made a great wedding feast and he invited people to come and at the time of the feast he said to his servant go out and bid those who are invited to come and the servant came back and said one of them says he's not coming because he's gotten married he's got a wife another said he's not coming he's bought some oxen and he's gone to plow Another one says he's not coming because he's bought some real estate and he's going over to see it. And he said, go out and compel them in the highways and the hedges to come in that my house might be full. Excuses. A lot of people today say, well, preacher, I would be saved, but my wife is keeping me from God. Or, preacher, it's my husband. If it wasn't for my husband, I'd live a Christian life. Or, preacher, I, you just don't understand why I'm trying my best to get ahead. And I'm buying real estate and I'm doing these other things and I'm trying to lay up in store so that one day I'll be able to retire. The rich man, the rich farmer said that. He said, I know what I'll do. I'll tear down these barns and I'll build bigger barns and then I'll say, I'm going to retire and take it easy. And God said, thou fool, this night shall thy soul be required of thee. Oh, but preacher, I'm young. I'm popular. And in order to maintain my popularity, I have to do these things. I have to go to those places. My friends would not understand if I did not. And you'll sell your soul for a little popularity. But may I tell you, there's a day coming when your popularity will be gone, your beauty will be gone, your fame will be gone. And the only thing that's left then is what did you do with your soul? With your soul. Well, preacher, I, I, I would come to church, but the ball game comes on, and I, I just can't miss the ball game. Preacher, I, I would come, but I'm working two jobs. I've got to make sure I keep all the debts paid. Preacher, I, I, I would do that, but, and we look at all the excuses that Satan puts out there to keep men from God and get them to hell. Secondly, he puts in every church some people who will scare folks off from God. Hypocrites. Hypocrites. I hear people all the time say, well, I'm just as good as them hypocrites down there at the church. I want you to know I agree with that. As a matter of fact, if you're not better than some of the hypocrites I know, they sure ain't anything to you. But they're hypocrites. In every church, I want you to understand, dear friend, that the church is not perfect. As much as we would want to be, there's only one who is, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people say, well, I, I know some crooked preachers. I do too. Man, they're so crooked they'll have to screw their coffin on when they die. I know some crooked deacons. I do too. They have to twist into their shirt every morning. I know, hey, you can name them. I know that every church has got their share of them and souls who are on the outside seeing hypocrites. They say, we won't go to God. We won't give our heart to God because of those hypocrites. But I want you to know, dear friend, I'd rather sit by them and sing with them here than to be with them in eternity without God. 
Oh, scarecrows, hypocrites. When I was a boy, we didn't have a lot of the entertainment we've got now. We didn't have television. I am that old. I can remember when television came in. We didn't have a lot of those things, so we invented our own games. And every summer evening, we spent our time out playing in the yard. Well, after dark, we were playing games. Back in those days, we got excited over little things. And we'd see a fallen star. Somebody would say, ah, look, 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 you, ah, did you see that? And we'd get so excited over fallen stars. They even tell us now when we can get up two or three, four o'clock in the morning so we can see them. And I've done that. I've stood at the window like an idiot looking up there, there trying to see those things falling out of the heavens. Ah, did you see that? <laughs> but we forget about all those millions that are still up there that didn't fall. And while there's some hypocrites in the church, folks, I want you to know the vast majority of the people of God are still walking tall, walking straight, keeping their lives pure and clean, still praying, still worshiping, still praising God. And get your eyes off of the hypocrites. Get them on Jesus because he'll never fail. He'll never fail. And then he fills your mind with lies. He tells you stuff like, you've got plenty of time. But the Bible says, boast not yourself of tomorrow. For no man knows what tomorrow may bring. The Bible says that life is like a vapor. It appeareth for a moment and then it's gone. Life is like a weaver's shuttle running to and fro. Having been brought up in a textile community and in a textile mill, I've seen my daddy's looms where the shuttle just went back so fast you could hardly see it. One of the men in our early service said to me, Pastor, a few years ago I didn't know what it was to feel bad. But suddenly the, the hands on the clock of my life spun around a few times and I feel bad all the time. Let me tell you something. Life at its best is getting gone quicker than you could even think. And you can't hold it back for one moment. But the devil will say, you got plenty of time. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. But the Bible says, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thought. And again, the Bible says, he that be often reproved and stiffeneth or hardeneth his neck shall be cut off and that without remedy the word remedy there in the Hebrew translated remedy into our language really means without notice I want you to know that when death comes to your house he won't send some messenger a week or two ahead of time and tell you you need to get right you're going to die he'll just show up and put his icy fingers around your throat and choke the life right out of you and your neighbors will come by and they'll cry and say he is a good man but if you don't have Jesus in your heart when death has come calling friend you're lost and lost forever 21 times listen to this 21 times in the Bible God says that man dies suddenly or he dies in an unconscious coma. And through these many years of preaching the gospel I want you to know that I've stood by the bedside of scores of people and watched them as they gasped and, and took their last breath and went out. I've stood by the bedside of many more who were unconscious and had no time to pray, no time to beg God. They died suddenly, and they died in a coma. And I've noted, by the way, that there are no breath banks. There may be eye banks, and there may be heart banks, and other organ banks, but there is no breath bank. And friend, when your heart stops and your lungs cease to pump oxygen into your body and your brain dies in hell, you will be if you die without God. Now there are three signs on this road to hell that I want to make you aware of. Number one, you can sin away your day of grace. The Bible says, Behold, 
Now is the time. Behold, today is the acceptable day of salvation. Not tomorrow. Not when you're old. Now. Now. Can you send away your day of grace? Is there a point beyond which God will not go? Does not God say in the book of Genesis in chapter 6, Behold, my spirit shall not always strive with man. There is a place beyond which God will not go. And I don't know where that is in your life or anyone else's life for that matter, but I know it's true. The second sign is mental illness. You say, well, preacher, I don't have to worry about that. I'm sane. There's not even any hint of mental illness in my family. May I just say to you, dear friend, there may be some little thing growing inside of your brain that you don't even know is there. The doctor has any idea that there's anything there, but it can press on a nerve and you'll wake up tomorrow babbling idiot or some other many thing could happen to you I could take you to another state and introduce you to a young lady who was one of the most brilliant women that ever lived graduated from, from uh, college when she was 18 years of age got a job with NASA down in Houston was invited out to a marijuana party she didn't even know what it was but she went along with her friends and they gave her a joint of marijuana she smoked it and something happened inside of her brain nobody knows exactly what but today she can't find her way in and out of of a room she is absolutely unaware mental illness is a sign that says get your heart right while your mind is clear thirdly is the reprobate mind in the book of Romans in the book of Romans in chapter 1 the Bible says and as even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. A reprobate mind, that mind that don't think about God, that mind that feeds itself on the things of this world, that mind that wallows in the muck and the mire and the filth of this world, that mind that thinks that the off-scouring of humanity is that which is to be desired, that mind that falls into the reprobate, that mind which becomes the homosexual and the lesbian, that mind which becomes the bestiality people People, that mind which curses God and mocks God and says no to God, that mind. God gives them up to a reprobate mind. They don't even think about God anymore. They don't think about their souls anymore. They only think about feeding their own body, feeding their own lust, and giving themselves to the fulfillment of themselves. Is that a time? Hey, you can know people just like I do that they thought they were in control, they were going to do their own thing, but they found out that as a further they went away from God, that finally God so far they don't know where God is. And then the fourth sign is God leaves you. Now folks, I want you to know one of the most frightening things in the world is for a person to suddenly wake up one day and God's gone. God's gone. God's gone. Does that ever happen? I stood in the home of a very wealthy man tried my best to convince him of his need for Jesus and in anger he commanded me out of his house threatened to kill me if I didn't leave I left his house within just a few weeks about six that man died he died trying to drive the demons off of his bed that had come to drag his soul down to hell. All of his money didn't help him then. All of his arrogance didn't help him then. God was gone. And the devil came to claim his soul. A former beauty queen sat on the back row of this auditorium. I preached my heart out. I pled for souls Though I did not call her name, I pled that she would respond. And I watched her shake her head time and again. She would make eye contact with me for a moment, drop her head and say no. She walked out of the service and she arrived home. An angry lover that she had rejected met her, raped and killed her. God! was gone 
God was gone. Warrenville, South Carolina, where I pastored First Baptist Church. Tall man, standing there right at the lip of the balcony. God dealt with him, but he would not respond. My deacon brother, standing by his side, said, I'll go with you if you'll go, but he would not. Within the hour, we heard the ambulance that carried his body to the, to the hospital scream its news. And when he got there, he was dead on arrival. God had left him in the city of Greer on a Thursday evening. We had begged that he'd give his heart to Jesus, but he said no to God. He said, not now, preacher. Someday I will, preacher, but not tonight. Oh, please, but no entreaty did any good. Finally, we left. And within three hours of leaving, he had gone to his work. Suddenly, he was stricken with a heart attack and he died. What had happened? He crossed over that line and he said, God, I don't want you. And God said, my grace will go no further. And God left him and Satan came and dragged his soul down to eternity without God. Dr. J. Harold Smith, one of America's greatest preachers of, of history, was preaching in the state of Arkansas. In that service, the building packed on the back pew was a young teenage couple, college students. And they mocked Dr. Smith as he preached on the subject of hell. They sat up on the back of the pew, mocked the preacher, laughed at him when he talked about hell. When the service was over, that young man came by and said to the preacher, My daddy is a professor down at the college. He says there is no hell. <laughs> How far is hell, preacher? And walked away. He and the pastor had gone out for a meal. And they saw the flashing lights of the fire engines and the police go by and the pastor said that may be some of my people I'd better go see so they got in the car and drove just a short distance and there was a Ford Mustang turned upside down gas linking out of it the police trying to hold people back because the, the car was a potential bomb that young couple inside were the people who had just mocked the preacher minutes before and they can't get out. And some stupid guy sucking on a cigarette flipped it over into the gasoline on the road and it exploded into flames. And that young couple was being burned to death. And that young man kept crying out, Tell that preacher I didn't mean it. Tell that preacher I didn't mean it. Tell that preacher I didn't mean it. And when it was all over and the fire had been extinguished and the bodies had been extracted from that burned carcass of an automobile, Dr. Smith said to the pastor, drive me back to the church. He said, but they're going to be waiting for us down at the restaurant. He said, we'll go. But he said, first drive me back to the church. And as they pulled up in the churchyard, he leaned over and looked at the odometer. He said, Pastor, it's 3.2 miles to hell. Without God, hell is ahead. Without forgiveness, there is no hope. At the end of a godless life is a godless eternity. And God brought you here today to remind you once again of the preciousness of your soul and to plead with you that you'll give your life to Christ. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. In a moment when we sing, 
I'm going to ask people from all over this auditorium to respond. Young men, young women, grandmothers and granddads, daddies and mothers, to come and say to the preachers here at the altar, I want to give my heart to Jesus. I don't want to stand a chance. I want to make certain that my soul is secure in the arms of God. If there's any doubt in your mind that you've ever been saved, you ought to be down the aisle, down the aisle in a hurry, seeking God, calling on His name. If you, if you have lived in a way inconsistent with Christian life and you know in your heart this is not the way God would have it be, even if you're saved, you ought to get right with God today. But if you're not sure, you ought to come down this aisle and say, I want to settle it with God so that I know of whom I have believed. If you're here, you've got loved ones that are lost and undone without God on their way to an eternity without hope. There ought to be tears in your eyes. There ought to be a brokenness in your heart. And down on this altar you ought to come pleading to God for their souls. I don't know what God's saying to you, but I know that in this congregation all over this place, God is calling you to repentance. Esau said, hey, I don't need that birthright. I'm just interested in taking care of things on my own life now. But then God left. And he sought for a place to repent. And wept. But he couldn't find God. And God's here. I know he is. I prayed him here. God's here. His spirit is walking the aisles, moving among the pews, touching hearts. And today is the day of salvation. And while we sing in just a moment, I'm going to ask you all over this building to say yes to the wooing voice of God. Pray with me. Father, this is your message. This is your time. I've extended your invitation. Now, Father, Oh, dear God, call this people to repentance. And I'll bless you. I'll praise you for every decision registered. For dear souls saved. For lives changed. For homes rescued. Oh, God, have your way in all of us. I pray in Jesus Christ. Amen. While we're standing, we're going to be singing hymn number 307. You be the first. You be the first to answer the call of God and come. Just as I am, and you're coming from the balcony, from the main level. You're coming while God is calling you. You're coming while God calling you. Hallelujah. You're coming. Surrendering your heart, your life, and your all to God. Come on. Come on. Come on.
responding even as the Spirit continues to draw, calling you, calling you, calling you. Answer his call right now and say yes to Jesus. You come. You come. not tarry much longer except I just need to plea once again I feel like that we're standing at the very very doors of hell saying one more time don't walk away from God don't take another step away but turn and come to Jesus I'm not playing little games Folks, I want you to know I've never preached a sermon that has eaten me up like this sermon has. This is the hardest message I've ever preached for me. But I'm telling you the truth. And I plead with you that you'll come. Now there may be some here that you want to come and say, I want to join the church. If that be the decision the Spirit would have you to make, then you come. Whatever God's telling you, hear His voice. And you come while we're saying, come on. somebody is it you is it you some couple join your hands and say let's put our heart let's put our home in God's church and you come One last call, just for you, just for you, just for you. God bless you for your patience and your prayers. Continue to pray. And I encourage you to be back tonight, the Lord willing. I'm going to be preaching tonight on the principle of sowing and reaping. I believe this is a message you need to hear. And I'll ask you to pray. I'll be going almost immediately to the mortuary where we'll be conducting the funeral services for Ms. Ruth Cook. You'll be praying for her family that God will comfort them, but even in this, that God would use her passing to call others to surrender to the Master. God bless you. It's a great day to be alive and to know you're a Christian. Amen. Hallelujah. If I didn't know, I wouldn't leave this place. I'd call her somebody and say, you've got to pray for me. I don't want to leave this place till I've settled it all with God. Bow your heads with me.